Welcome everyone to the Global Consulting Organization Futurecast. This is our multimedia platform for 2030 and beyond, reimagining the future of real estate, where we share the ideas, inspirations, and ideals that will become the foundation for the future built environment. I'm Amit Egan Datwani, founder and chief consultant of Global Consulting Organization, and on behalf of my fellow members of the GCL Collective, welcome you to our latest episode of the FutureCast. This live FutureCast was recorded at our first ever Power of the Collective event on October 2nd, 2024 at the Hyatt Place in downtown West Palm Beach. I co-hosted the event with my colleague and friend, Eddie Paredes, National Account Manager with First American, and we shared a variety of insights and perspectives about the importance of the collective in the years 2030 and beyond, and also provided attendees with present-day guidance on the importance of building a like-minded network. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to our first ever Power of the Collective. Next level teamwork for next generation real estate. My name is Amit Egan Datwani. I'm founder and chief consultant of Global Consulting Organization. We're a project starting firm that's visioning, branding, and marketing the neighborhoods, communities, and cities of the future. Eddie Paredes, first American title NCS. I'm not the founder or the CEO. That <laughs> company's been around 136 years, so. Um, but you look good. <laughs> I, I age well. But definitely a connector. I know most of you guys. I will know all of you before we leave tonight. And you know, my role is title insurance, but more than anything, it's building relationships and connecting you to who you want to meet. And we're joined by my son, Krishna Egan Datwani. JB2. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually been coming with me to meetings since I was thinking about this today, since he was eight years old. And he turns 14 on Friday, so a little round of applause for the birthday boy. <laughs> I know, I, that's my job. <laughs> no, <laughs> never, never, never. He represents, as does Gray, who is our colleague Tony's son, they represent the next generation. Today, at any point in time, if you're listening to some of the perspectives that we're talking about, and some of them may not make any sense as of this moment, please keep in mind that a lot of the concepts that we're going to be sharing with you today are for the next generation. They're a little futuristic. They may be a little bit out of left field. You may look at me like I have 10 heads. I'm used to it. But the idea is to potentially get you thinking in a way that you have not thought before. That's my portion of the program. And then Eddie is going to come on afterwards. And then we're going to give you a little bit of the nuts and bolts, how we're going to get into the future. We have this big roadmap. Hopefully this will be the first of many programs. And uh, we hope you enjoy. But again, thanks for joining us. Anyone know that character on the screen? Waldo. What's the word that is used before Waldo? Where? That feeling of where's Waldo? It's a little bit of curiosity. You're looking at the puzzle. You're wondering where's Waldo, right? I've experienced that feeling multiple times walking into networking events, walking into rooms where I did not know a soul, walking into rooms where I'll get like this odd look. Like, you know, when you walk into the room, there's like these five circles of people and they look at you, they give you this strange look, like, who's that guy? Or you, anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, okay. That feeling is highly common. Did any of you have that feeling of uncertainty coming to today? Be honest. Okay, thanks for being honest. And it's something that we want to transform. We want networking events to be engaging. We want them to be productive. We want you to feel like you added value to your life. And we don't want you to feel like the Where's Waldo puzzle. So in order to get there, though, I have some requests. There's this Buddhist saying of empty your cup. Anyone heard it? Yeah. Okay. So in order to get there, 
I'm asking you just for 75 to 90 minutes to empty your cup. Any information that you've come in with, some people may call it baggage, any experience that you may have, any knowledge that you may have, any wisdom that you've accumulated over the years about networking and how it's meant to be done, our request is to please empty your mind. Just empty it. Again, only 75 to 90 minutes. Not that, not that long. The mind and the heart are like a parachute. They work best when open. The mind and heart are like a parachute. They work best when open. So easy, right? When open. <laughs> I'm asking you to first empty your mind. You can empty your mind and not have it open. It's important that you also keep the mind open. Not easy. <laughs> And now the most difficult one. Anyone, please be honest. If you don't raise your hand here, I think you're lying. Any, anyone gone through a challenging relationship in your life? <laughs> what happens when you go through a challenging relationship? How open are you going into a new relationship? What do we do? Automatically, we close down, right? The energy closes. When you go through a difficult relationship, it's very difficult to keep the heart open. And many people will say to you that, oh, business and personal are separate. I think that's hogwash. If you shut down emotionally and you walk into a room, it's going to be very difficult to attract a partner, a colleague of like mind. So again, please try your best. It's not even 75 minutes, and then we're down to like 70 minutes now. So for 70 minutes, <laughs> try to keep an open mind and heart. The year 2020, please raise your hands if that was a significant year in your life. Who's brave enough, 10 seconds or less, raise your hand if you want to share why. Jordan? I had the pleasure of homeschooling two children. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> I feel... I feel for you. Yeah. So that year, I term it, I like to look for the silver lining in experiences. I term it 2020 vision. 2020 vision is when you can see very clearly. I feel a lot of us were given the opportunity in 2020 to look very clearly at our lives and make certain decisions in our lives as to whether or not we needed to make any changes in our lives, in our work, and in our relationships. One of the biggest changes that we made was how we work and where we work. All of that resulted in what I see as a transformational shift in human consciousness. We are going through an unbelievable shift in consciousness right now as we speak here. And it's continuing to play out, and it will continue to play out for years to come. And the result has been traumatic in the commercial real estate world. What you see there is a very brief snapshot of some of the cities around the country and their office space. We have approximately 5 billion square feet of office space in this country, and we have close to 1 billion square feet now vacant. To give you an idea of that, in 2019, we had approximately 11 or 12% office space vacant in 2019. In five years, we have now almost doubled that. Unbelievable change is taking place in commercial real estate. The result of the shift in consciousness with regards to how we work, and where we work. That change that I was just referring to represents a potential commercial real estate crisis. Some may say we're already in a crisis. I think it's potential because it really depends on what happens over the next 12 to 24 months. As I shared with you, 
of our office space in this country is vacant. A billion square feet vacant. What's interesting is approximately $2 trillion, $2 trillion in loan maturities are now coming due by the year 2027. To put that very simply, for those that may not be familiar with this, owners locked in interest rates in a world where interest rates were very low for 10 plus years. And now we're in a situation where owners are in a higher rate environment, resulting in higher interest rates. Simultaneously, rent income is dropping significantly because of vacant office space. On top of all this, by the year 2028, we will have 500 million square feet in office space expiring. These are companies most likely that have signed deals that were longer term, which was traditional in commercial real estate. These days, no company wants to sign a 10 year deal. <laughs> Everyone wants flexibility. We have another 500 million square feet of office space coming onto the market on top of everything that I mentioned. Depending on what report you now read, we have approximately 4.5 million homes that were in deficit in this country. We've got all this office space that's on the market, that's coming on the market. We have a great need for homes. We've got this dynamic taking place that some people say we're in an urban doom loop. An urban doom loop means resources, businesses, people, restaurants, you name it, are fleeing cities. You see this taking place in St. Louis. You see it taking place in San Fran. San Fran has 40% office vacancy. San Francisco. New York City has 100 million square feet, almost. 100 million square feet vacant. What I suggest to clients is that rather than this being an urban doom loop, can we look at this as an opportunity for an urban boom loop? And where we have suffering central business districts, can we create something called a central living district where we design the neighborhoods around the concepts of home, comfort, and well-being? This is actually happening in the financial district. How many of you are familiar with the financial district in New York? In the financial district, you have millions of square feet that have already been converted over the past 30 years. A lot of subsidies and incentives were given to the developers to convert. And you're seeing a neighborhood that is called the financial district now looking like a residential neighborhood. To me, it screams central living district, but who am I to say? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Show of hands, how many of you have heard this quote? Now be honest, how many of you are guilty? <laughs> I'm gonna fit the round peg in the square hole, right? <laughs> I'm going to make it work. <laughs> you are not going to get in my way. <laughs> this is something that's taking place in the office world. I was meeting with an individual last week who told me that rates have, are now coming down. You have companies that are mandating employees, mandating that they must attend the office five days a week. Mandates. Amazon, Walmart, financial companies. Quick survey of the Amazon employees stated that, and this was a quick survey, 700 people, I believe, 70% of them said they're going to reevaluate their desire to stay with Amazon. 70%. But it's all going to go back the way that it was. People are even saying that in three years, hybrid work will not even exist. <laughs> I remind you, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results.
Just something to think about. My wife and I saw this amazing movie the other night, Megalopolis. It's a mouthful. <laughs> I convinced her to come with me and we loved it. I won't get into too much detail because of the time limitation that we have, but it's a story about what's taking place in the world today. It's about a crashing city. And there's an interesting storyline. You have the visionary architect that has this utopian version of New York City. And then you've got the traditional mayor, old school, sticking to his guns, that does not want to change the city. And then of course, the architect falls in love with the mayor's daughter. <laughs> they have a kid together. And long story short, the mayor, at least how I perceived it, seeing his grandchild helped him realize and think about the next generation. And doing so opened up his thinking to some new ideas that he felt he may have needed in the city. And what's interesting about that movie, one other note I'll share with you is that this was a movie directed by Francis Ford Coppola of The Godfather. It was a movie that took him 40 years, supposedly, to put together. It was a passion project. He spent over $100 million of his own money to put it together. And it just so happens to come out during the year that this topic is now in pop culture and mainstream media. Interesting timing. Anyone recognize that character on the screen? George, yes. Anyone else used to wake up Saturday mornings and run to the TV to watch? Yes, all right, thank you, awesome. And if you can share, why? Why come you're still watching it? <laughs> Seriously. It's, a, it's amazing because a lot of that stuff is happening mm -hmm. now. Yeah. <laughs> and what's interesting is supposedly that took place in the year 2062. And that picture right there is Mr. Jetson in the office where he went to supposedly twice a week for one hour each. And I'm not suggesting that's what life will be like in the year 2062, but I'm sharing this image to hopefully prompt you in your thinking to start thinking about what your life may look like and what you may want it to look like. And here's the plug for the collective and who you may want in your life in the year 2030 and beyond. Raise your hand and please be honest. How many of you have relationships in your lives? You're like, eh, if that person disappeared tomorrow, I think I'd be okay. Be honest, come on. Come on, Jesus. Come on, need to get some drinks in here. Like, come on. <laughs> Thank you for those of you that have been honest. <laughs> so the years 2030 and beyond, they represent the future, at least for this conversation. And a couple of the key ideas that we will be integrating into our discussions in the years ahead are creative and flexible intelligence. And I'm going to just share with you a couple quick ideas about what those concepts are today. So creative intelligence. How many of you have a passion or some type of work that you do on the side that you wish could be your main flow of income. And if, please keep your hands up if you don't mind. For those of you with their hands up, is there a reason, why, if you can share, is there a reason why that is not your main flow of income? If anyone is comfortable sharing, if you're not, it's fine. Gary, you wanna share real quick? I think right now it's the, I mean, I think I would be, like, call it a, like, breaking point or a tipping point where I need to meet the right people to connect and kind of changing, the, I guess, the under overstanding of what I'm actually doing. Perfect. Gary was not planted today. That answer about meeting the people. <laughs> we did not pay him to say that. I swear, we did not. Think about this now. I know there's some people that did not put their hands up. I know there's some people that want to be doing something else. And many times what's missing is the connection to the right person. And you gotta be a little bit more creative in how you go about getting that done. We are here today to facilitate that. We are here to 
potentially help you to connect to certain individuals that can propel you on your path. And this idea of creative intelligence, if you had your hand up, most likely that is a representation of your God-given gift. Most likely. That's just my take on it. And you are potentially, from now until 2030 and beyond, you are potentially challenged to figure out how you can make that your main flow of income. And hopefully the collective can help you get there. Flexible intelligence. This is an interesting concept. And try to, I'll try to explain this succinctly. Please try your best to follow me. There are many opportunities now in the business world to have flexible arrangements. If you're creative about it. So you need to use your creative intelligence to set yourself up in flexible arrangements. I'll give you an example. Let's say you work for a corporation. You work there five days a week and you're doing a great job. Chances are, if you're not doing a great job, you can't do what I'm about to say. You're doing a great job. You're performing. You're hitting your numbers every quarter. But you want to be doing something else. If you use your flexible intelligence, perhaps you can go to your higher ups and suggest to them, I think I can do all this in four days. Thus giving yourself a fifth day, could be Friday, where everyone works from home, right? <laughs> where you then are able to do your God-given gift to see if you can make that your main flow of income. Again, what did I say in the beginning? Open mind is key, right? Because in the mind right now, could be all sorts of voices going. <laughs> she knows what I'm saying, right? <laughs> could be mom's voice, dad's voice, partner's voice, boss's voice, kid's voice. Probably not your voice. Whose voice is that, right? Many times you have this voice in your head, like who is that that's there? That's not me. Point to yourself real quick. Notice if you take a quick scan around the room, if you don't mind, quick scan. If you notice, everyone is not pointing here, but we listen to this. Why? Here. Open heart. A lot of answers in there. So now we get to the heart of the program. That was a little bit of a, the background. Wanted to give you a sense for the story and where we are going and the bigger picture. And now we're going to be talking about the collective. The plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage, willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities have little to do with success as we have defined it. How many of you resonate with this quote? No coincidence that you're here. This represents the types of individuals that are gravitating towards this movement that we're just starting. You notice there's nothing in here about pro formas, the bottom line, the black and white that we all hear from our bosses, right? And when I talk about lovers, lovers in the sense of people who love their work, are so passionate, they wake up every day loving life, right? Like, isn't that the dream? <laughs> Peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. Those types of individuals, we feel, will help to redefine planet Earth in the years to come. To give you a quick background on my company, Global Consulting Organization was started 10 years ago, actually 10 years from this past Monday. And when I started the company, I started off with a mission statement. And that mission statement was to positively impact others and enhance the human experience. At the time, I was working as a broker. And let me tell you, telling clients about this mission statement, <laughs> working as a broker, <laughs> I quickly stopped after like three pitches. <laughs> they were concerned about making money, which is the reason many of us are in business. I totally understand that. And long story short, why you see Tom Cruise there, he's my cue to talk about a pilot project. Tom Cruise was the notable pilot from Top Gun, as many of you know. 
I was working as a broker from 2014 to 2019, didn't really feel fulfilled at all, and realized that I could do much more. I had worked in the fashion business for 10 years until 2010, the global financial crisis hit. I had no choice but to close two businesses, men's and women's casual sportswear companies. Awesome business, a lot of fun, it completely changed. Working in real estate, I sensed that there was a need for more creativity, specifically in commercial real estate. So in 2019, I was given an opportunity to work on a pilot project for a new set of services that I envisioned for my company that we call today visioning, branding, and marketing, the 31 different services that we offer to our clients. And that resulted from the tapping into my creative intelligence. The pilot project went phenomenally well. I was able to bring on 35 different colleagues to the project from 19 different cities around the world. And the result was phenomenal. I had an amazing time working with these colleagues. The colleagues also truly enjoyed it. And after the project, they said, when can we work on the next project? Let's fast forward to present day. What you see up on the screen is a representation of where we want to take this idea of the collective into the future. For-profit plus non-profit integration equals happiness. And what do I mean by that? There's three different components that we envision within the collective. The first one is collaboration, dynamic cooperation to power creativity and efficiency, commerce, curated talent to achieve superior outcomes and deliverables, and philanthropy, purposeful work to realize meaningful results. This equation is something that we feel will be very important to the success of the future built environment. As you're aware, I shared with you the challenges that we are facing in the commercial real estate industry. We strongly feel what's needed is the creation of this concept called the collective in order to help fast track the redevelopment of the future built environment in the years 2030 and beyond. So to give you a feeling for what this may be like, I'd like you to just close your eyes for a minute. Don't worry, we're in a safe space and this will really help you to feel what I'm talking about. Now imagine yourself working with a group of like-minded individuals who share a passion for the project that you're working on. That's the collaboration component. Then think about the creative intelligence concept that I shared with you. We are tapping into your unique gift, your God-given talent, why you were born on this planet, and envision yourself doing that work on this project with people who are also tapping into their God-given gifts. And you're collaborating together to work towards a mutual goal. And to add to that, just think about how powerful this concept would be if we can work on a project that then positively impacts others and enhances the human experience. That could be through the benefit of a nonprofit initiative that the group comes up with. That could be some type of benefit towards any type of need in society that we may have. Just think about the power of working with such an amazing group of people, doing that work that you love, that you're so excited about. You jump out of bed every day. And then all of it being for the betterment of planet Earth. Why I said this is for profit plus non profit integration equaling happiness is I feel this is one of the greatest ways to potentially help humans to be more happy on planet Earth. 
doing the work that you love, working with people that you also love, who also love the project that you're working on. And then that project completely transforming the experience of what it is to work on projects together on the planet. Imagine that feeling. Tap into what that would feel like going to work every day, experiencing that joy, experiencing that love, tapping in to that collective intelligence of the group is something that is going to be so vital for the future, benefiting from our group's resources, networks, knowledge, experience, and insight is a basic summation of the concept of collective intelligence. One of the other concepts that we're now in the process of developing in the years ahead. And as we close, I leave you with one final thought. The Justice League, as many of you know, was formed to defend humanity. What I'm asking you to ponder is, can we create the Justice League of real estate that comes together to positively impact others and enhance the human experience? Thank you. This next segment is a snippet of some of the great wisdom that Eddie imparted on our guests. If you like what you hear and want to hear more, be sure to keep a lookout for our next Power of the Collective event in 2025, as we only share bits and pieces of information and to experience the true value of the power of this new creation, it's best experienced live with other collective members alongside you. So my portion is networking. How many of you guys really, really enjoy going out there and networking? You find it fruitful every single time? What's the objective of when you go out networking? What are you hoping or who are you hoping to meet? The most common answer I hear, and I network a lot, I've either met you guys networking, I've met you guys through an introduction, or I've made introductions for you. For me personally, going to networking is to build a relationship and the byproduct is the business. That's the dessert. It's the relationships. The most common answer people say when you say, why do you go networking? It's because they're looking for business. Now, how many of you would trust somebody and you first engage and hand you a business card? Would you trust them with your business? It's blind. The card doesn't say anything that's going to say, let me put all my full trust in you. Your referral to a client of another individual can doom you if the service is bad. So it's important to build the relationship to understand what they do, what's their role, what company they work for. Do they have ambition? Where are they looking to go? Why are they networking? Did their job force them to go out there and network? Are they there to build their own company or brand? Are they looking to build a network, a relationship? It's got a lot of questions and I go to a lot of networking events. And a lot of people see me there. A lot of people engage with me. There's a lot of people that want to follow me on social media to go to the organizations I go to network for or with. I go more than anything to build relationships and to analyze the people. To understand what motivates them, what triggers them, why are they there? I want to learn about them. So when I go there, I rarely ever, and I don't think there's a single person in this room that can say, I called you and asked you for business. I, and I do business with people in this room. I built the relationship first. I want you to see what integrity I have, how I carry myself, how I'm going to treat your clients. Now for me, I go also to networking because I know my clients' needs. And I'm trying to vet people that I know are going to be able to come through and service my clients. And the more I service my clients, the more bad value I add to the clients. And that's why I network. I hand out business cards. Most people do. How many times do you actually follow through? How many times do you follow up? How many times have you gone to a networking event, met somebody and said, who would you like to meet? Scanned the room and brought them to the person they wanted to meet. See, that person shows, wow, you did it. Good. You didn't even know me. But here you are trying to help me grow my network. So if you go there with your self-interest, which most of the textbooks say what? 
be calculated, have an amazing 30 second elevator pitch. I don't pitch. I tell you who I am, what I do. I'll tell you what company I work for, how we could possibly help you. But I try to say, you know what? I'm going to unconditionally always try to deliver for you. And that's how I've grown my network. And it's always addition by subtraction. To build a collective, you should have a bunch of different disciplines that service what you do for a living. So if my, you know, I do commercial title insurance. You ask most people, what's commercial title insurance? They'll say, you're a title company and they have no clue. You ask most people, do you have a policy? Do you have an owner's policy? Do you have a loan policy? Yeah, I do. What does it do for you? I don't know. But they know that I do commercial title insurance, but there's not a lot of transaction that doesn't involve it. But they still don't understand what it does. So that's okay. What I'm trying to do is, you know, I know what my clients need. And I want my clients to say to me, the connector, this is what I need. Help me put those things together. And I think if you build the network where you're saying to yourself, I have all these people, all these connections around me. I listen at networking events for the needs of the people, not only my clients, but of my network. And I say, you know what? You're looking for something. We can't work together, but I have somebody. I have an attorney. I have a, a person that does like, I have everyone in this room that can service something. What I need to know is I built the relationship with you first to then make the referral. Because I, I feel confident in it. You're going to take care of my client. You're going to take care of my network. And then I built the network with those people. You come through, you show up, you give face, you always go in. It matters to me, the integrity. It matters to me if you come through. It matters to me if you follow up. But it also matters for my client because you can lose a client just for somebody not. I've heard clients say nobody follows up. Nobody call me. Nobody. I don't like the way that feels. I don't like to hear it from my client. I take it personally. I remove that person from my list. If you can't come through, you're out. But if you can build a solid network of drivers of vision people, of people that forward thinking, that want to move the pendulum, they want to do work, then your networking is great because you're going to be getting business. All these people, I got a call last week and this is what let me know I'm going down the right path. The person was so excited on the phone call that I couldn't pause them to understand what they were saying. You know, I got him some leads and made some introduction and left for, to work for him. It's not my same field, not my, it wasn't commercial real estate, it wasn't even related. But he found an opportunity to make one for me and he was excited that he can call me and say, I'm paying you back. If you have a great network, they're not only listening for what serves them, the I. They're looking for what serves their network, their people, their relationships. And they know it's going to come back to you. But you take care of others and they'll take care of you. And that's for me what's networking. That's what we go out for and meet people. And that's why some of these questions might seem common. Some of these are on a business card. But clearly, what's the most important one? And we'll go through it. And I'm sure there's people in this room that can either introduce you or all the person you're trying to look for on this card. But if you say, I, I go to a networking event, are you planning before you get there? Are you strategic? Did you do research? Or did you pick the person that you say, well, who do you want to meet? I want to meet Stephen Ross. Okay. Is he even at that networking event? No. So how would you assume going to a networking event? Or they see somebody in a corner surrounded by a hundred people and they say, when they're holding their business card waiting for a gap to open. I usually see who's around them. Or I meet the people around them that eventually would lead to the introduction of the person. But you built the relationships. And then the more comfort you get, then they're trying to find ways to make an introduction for you. But if you don't build the relationship, what's great, if networking works out for you, that's, that's awesome. But I think there's more of a creative way to do it, to build a network with every discipline and you don't saturate it. If you say, I, have, I need an attorney, I need, have one of every discipline. So when a deal comes in, everybody works on it. And you know who to bring in on this project because you built the network. And you, you vetted it. You have relationships with everybody. I think people in this industry don't hold each other accountable sometimes. If you don't call my client, you're going to get a call from me. Simple as that. Now I'm going to say, because then I'm going to say, why are you asking me for referrals? You don't take it serious. 
You got to take this serious. It's business, but it's personal. This is a relationship. And if you say, I'm, my relationship is only business, well, I don't know. You know, that's not the way really to do it. I want to have a personal relationship with you where you can count on me. And through it, we develop business and do work. But if I fail you, I failed you not only as a business, but I failed you as a friend. So I want you to hold me accountable. And that's part of this. So, you know, I want us to network together. I want us to talk. I want us to conversate. I want us later to go and have a drink, talk more. And if anyone that's on these cards or not on these cards is there, there's a group full of people that might get you to who you want to meet. I will tell you that if you put it on here or if you didn't and I ask you later, if you don't meet them here, I will find a way to do it. Those people here will tell you, I do make introductions. That's what I like to do. So I'm going to go through these out loud. If you left it blank, maybe you want to fill in and then, you know, we, we can expand on it. But if somebody's in the room that can do it, if somebody's in the room that says, hey, we're looking for, if you're in the room and you think you can make that introduction or you can meet the person to get to know them to eventually say, well, it's possible down the road. Let's connect. And I hope nobody's shy because if you're shy, you're networking. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> I thank you for tuning into today's FutureCast and taking into consideration some of the ideas, inspirations, and ideals that we believe will become the foundation for the future built environment. Let's take this once in a generation opportunity and use it to create best in class teams for the large scale real estate development projects of the future. Cheers to 2030 and beyond.